up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of F and Growth. What are we up to 63 today? We're going to talk all wow. about building a viral sales engine. So lots of talk about subscription businesses. Maybe y'all know where we're headed with some of this. Maybe you've seen some stuff uh, online. But you know, we talked about sales last week, continuing the conversation this week. We're going to dig a little deeper into the nuances of that sales process, specifically how to bring the customers to you, uh, the goods and bads of growing fast. So we're going to talk all about that. But before we get too far into this thing, let's F and Grow. Breathe deep. What's up, Joe? <laughs> Doing well. Breathing deep. Why am I so nervous? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. <laughs> Every time. Oh, what's going on, everybody? How are you? What's good today, Joe? Well, we are continuing our continuing our sales conversation. We talked sales last week. We said we'd talk about it again, and we're going to do that. We're going to work in some current events. Twitter was hot yesterday mm. with a lot of comments around the subscription model, around working with clients, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, but let's, before we get too far into that, let's see what's going on happening here in the comments. Hello, Tony gets that early thumbs up in. Uh, mm. And John, it looks like he's having a little problems uh, on a certain account, not being able to comment. So John, next time say hi and you'll get the first mention, but Tony Seats wins the prize today. Uh, Dale Jensen in the house, what's up? Rahulio, Scott Humphrey here, Stephen Hilario, Daniel Brasnio, what's up? Eric Freeland, Tanette is in the house. Happy Tuesday to you too. Uh, Greg Dolan is here, Michael Collins, what's up? There was a little squad of y'all. I think uh, some, yeah, some of them were meeting and gather earlier today. If you missed that, chatting about random automation stuff, I popped in current events, et cetera. But, Whatever, Krista McCollman in the house. Warda, hello. Let's see, Jeffrey, what's up? Good to see everyone. Good to see you too. Robert, good morning. Joseph Bates, Gabe Perez. We got a new in the house, Mil Milowan, Mil Milowan uh, Design. Finally made it to my first live show. Hello, hello. John Matias, oh, look, we lost Joe, okay. Uh, Roland is here, Penny is here. What's up, Geronimo? Al hola, hola, everyone. Happy to catch the episode in time. Mustafa's here. What's up, Christian Smith, Veos? Okay, let's get into this a little bit. Um, looks like we're getting a little bit of back and forth on Joe here. Um, we'll see if he pops back in or not. Uh, in the meantime, Let's take a look at a couple, oh, there he is, a couple of the announcements. So this Thursday, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to get into uh, going from client first, or uh, not client first, <laughs> Webflow client billing to Stripe. Uh, so we're going to be talking about some of that and uh, with Aaron Kornblit, uh, who's also doing a stream tomorrow. So let's jump into kind of some of the events updates. Colleen always hooks us up with uh, what's going on in events in the community. And so we've got to do a quick rundown on this. Anto Arianto is doing, uh, this may have already passed. Yeah, I think they already did this one. Uh, again, Aaron Kornblit Wednesday. Uh, he's going to build Wordle in Airtable. So that's going to be fun. His streams are always cool to learn a little bit about no code and automation. Check that out. Um, I think right after the stream, Right? Is that today, April 27th? I think that's after this, the Webflow stream, Joe? That's tomorrow. Ah, tomorrow, okay. I was, yeah. I was gonna say, then we have a hard out, but okay. So tomorrow, uh, the quarterly Q&A with Vlad is on. Let's see, also Wednesday, Edgar Allen, they've been doing these Webflow cafes all in Spanish. Uh, Melissa Mendez, her stock is up in the Webflow community, doing lots of events. Webflow party is on uh, right after that too, I think. So Edgar Allen, they're doing this Webflow cafe. And then there's a Webflow party, they're doing a challenge. Um, yeah, doing lots of stuff. So shout out to all of them. And then I think ton tonight, is this today? Or um, I'm not sure if this is today or tomorrow, but on LinkedIn, uh, that's what I gotta do, there it is right here, April 26th. So this is tonight at 8.30, speeding up your Webflow builds with external style guide. So there you go, uh, some updates on events and community things, random things. Go give Colleen uh, a follow there. She always does a good job keeping the community connected and keeping up with current events. Uh, so shout out to Colleen for helping us uh, just keep everyone up to date with events. So, okay, with that being said, let's get into the grunt of the show here, Joe. All the uh, announcements are out of the way. I think, did we miss anything? I think that's it. We can get right into the disclaimer. All right, let's do this. <clears throat> disclaimer, disclaimer number one. Not all growth is good growth. 
So we'll be talking a lot about growth today, a lot about sales, about leads. Ooh, now the show has started. Let's restart the stream. Now we're on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Tanette, Tanette called me out. Thanks for the reminder, Tanette. <laughs> <laughs> and for those audio listeners, Rymar just put on his fin suite That's hat. right. Oh, I knew so something now, was now missing. Now we're in business. I knew something was missing. Okay. <laughs> Back to the disclaimer, not all growth is good growth. We are talking a lot about this topic and we want to make it clear that it's not always a good thing. It could be negative. It could be negative for your business. It could be negative for your personal life. It could also be amazing and it could be really great, but not everything is really amazing and great. So that's disclaimer number one. Rymar, anything to add to that? Yeah, I just want to say that I was having a good hair day. So everyone out there talking shit about the hat, you know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, um, all, all growth is not good growth. I agree with that. Uh, we've talked about this before, toxic clients, forcing sales. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about virality and growth because sometimes, especially in this world, just like you can go viral with a blog article, you can go viral with you know some sales content, with a landing page, with some kind of offer to the world. And a lot of times you don't really know how that's going to end up. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the dynamics of that. How do you scale sustainably, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we all do want to grow a little bit. And so figuring out, figuring out how to do that means finding a way that works for us. And so hopefully this content will help you do that. So disclaimer number two is that you should find a pace and process that works specifically for what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes that's subscriptions. Sometimes that's fixed fees. I think we did an episode called How to Make Money with Webflow. Um, I don't know, maybe if, uh, 10 episodes ago, something like that. Uh, that kind of talked all about the different business models. So if you're interested in kind of diving into that, um, go check that episode episode out so okay that's all the disclaimers a um, little audience prompt you know maybe we'll ask you all what's holding you back from scaling your operation so we'd like to know from you are you growing as fast as you'd like are you um, facing any specific hurdles when it comes to growth uh, is there something you would like to learn about or something that you see as a hurdle that's stopping your growth um, share some share some thoughts in the comments and we'll address those as we go through the rest of the stream here I'm really interested to see what people say about this because there's so many reasons that can hold you back from growth. It could be time reasons, it could be money reasons. And you know what? I think a lot of the times it's confidence reasons, mm. especially when you're new at this, when you're just getting into it, you're, you're like, hey, I, I have this successful single person business. How do I take that to the next level? Do I take it uh -huh. to more clients? Do I take it to more people on the team? And yeah, I, I want to continue to talk about confidence as we do this episode, because that should be the thing that never holds you back. So that's keep that in mind when you're when you're giving these answers. So uh, <clears throat> I was not able here? to hear that last little bit. Uh, hang on a second here. I'm, I, I was not able to hear you, Joe. Uh, OBS. Check, check. Audio on Joe. There we go. Okay. I, got you. I got you back. I think hello, the audience hello. heard you, but I, I didn't. Okay. So I cannot um, comment back on whatever you just said there. So where where'd you cut? Where did I cut off? I, I don't remember. Um, just okay. literally like the last well, 20 the, seconds. The sum, yeah, the, the sum of that is I want to talk about confidence. Confidence should not be the thing that holds you back mm -hmm. in growth. Mm -hmm. So that will be a, a topic I want to keep addressing in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Anything else for the audience prompt before we move to the the, yeah. the show content? I think that's cool. it. Yeah, I think we jump right in. Great. All right, we're starting with story time. And we're going to... T okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on what's here, Joe. But yeah, you keep cutting out. The video uh, just dropped there up. for a second too. Yeah. Um, okay, on my end. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm not sure what's happening there, but we're just giving a little bit of. Uh, you sure good now? Um, you just dropped out there for a second. Okay. 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 I, I I never know if I should be repeating what I just said. Now we're, let's just, we're starting with story time. Yeah, let's just start at story time. A okay. uh, couple okay. comments coming in here. Cooper, not not all good growth is uh yeah good growth right or not all growth is good growth yeah for sure. Are you guys commenting on Design Joy or DJ? Seems plausible to the subject. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. We don't want to focus uh, specifically to that, but yeah, that's obviously trending in the news. So we'll discuss that a little bit. Uh, Philip Trot. Let's see my reasons. Full time job, confidence, imposter syndrome, no personal website, finding time to find clients. Okay. 
Mm. Something for me is creating a strong nice. contract template, working on it now with a lawyer who set up my LLC. Yeah, sometimes that can hold you back. Not quite enough confidence with Webflow knowledge keeps me from marketing, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, we're seeing, already seeing some confidence messages, yeah. which is normal. This is like, this is such a normal thing. This is not a bad thing. I also think it's something that anybody can get through, mm. can get past. That if you have a lack of confidence, that doesn't mean that has to be a, a character trait of yours. You can grow past that. So I, I hope that some of the content throughout this is going to help people break that confidence barrier. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's jump into it. Let's talk a little bit because we both started as solo uh, operators. Um, so may, yeah, maybe let's talk a little bit about our journey um, going from you know, zero to wherever it is we're now and wherever it is we're going next. So Joe, I don't know, do you wanna um, start out with some thoughts here? I'll, I'll jump in. The first year of FinSuite, about the first year was just me. I was the only person. I was called FinSuite, but it was just me making websites. I was designing, I was developing, I was selling, I was making the invoices, collecting the money. It was, it was a one person shop. And at that time, I remember wanting as many clients as possible, but having to be really careful about the types of clients that were brought on because I had this very low skill level. I was a first year learner. Mm. So there were a lot of times a project came in and I thought, well, I don't think I can do this. And I would have to turn projects down if that, that came up. So not only do you have problems bringing in leads, but you can have problems when the leads do come in, maybe you're not qualified to take on that project. And I think it's much better to turn down a project that you're not qualified in than to just bring projects on. Like I'm going to bring this on no matter what. That works when you know you can figure it out. But if you can't figure it out, it's a bad move. So I remember it was really difficult for me trying to get those right projects. And it was, I felt like it was always a struggle. I was having fun. I was really enjoying what I was doing, but money was a problem. Mm. I, I made a very, very, very low amount of money in the first year of FinSuite. Like <laughs> how much tell us, you tell me yours, I'll tell I you think, mine. <laughs> yeah. I think for the whole year I made $13,000. <sighs> which is very low living in New York. That's like, I mean, you make more money working minimum wage. I didn't think you were going to beat me. I didn't think you were going to make less than me. I made like 15 grand <laughs> when I close. first started. Close. <laughs> the first year I went out on my own, I think I made like, yeah, I was, and actually I don't even know if that was the first full year. I think that was like one of my years selling door to door. When I went out first on my own, I think I, I made like almost nothing for six months. Mm almost nothing. And I think that's the thing, right? People see now and they're like, Oh, look at FinSuite or they see people doing things. Um, and they don't see that, you know, they don't go back to like, I broke into the tech world. I think I shared this story the other day. Um, I don't remember if it was on a podcast or, or on this show. Um, I shared it a couple times of just how I started and how I landed this first client and how I hired somebody to do web development. And then they left me hanging like a month out from the delivery. And that's how I got into web development was having to kind of learn this stuff. And I've completely hacked my way into the tech world and now in this no code thing, it's taken like another step further. And I think a lot of times we, we get discouraged because we, we maybe don't make the progress. But I remember in those early days as well, I didn't even know where to go for clients. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know anything about like the web itself. So I was learning about how the web worked and also trying to sell this stuff, you know? So mostly I was just making shit up as I went. And I lived in, I live in a town um, where, you know, it's not very tech forward. It's a little older average age here in Sarasota. Um, and so it was always kind of looking to my local community and I figured, oh, hey, I could be the tech guy who stands out. And so I became the local guy who was doing the WordPress meetups and eventually those became the Webflow meetups. And um, yeah, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a very, difficult process when you're first starting out to get into this space and find the thing that's going to lead you to where you go. That's why we always talk about ex experimenting with so many different things and trying to do, uh, you know, like various things with your pricing models or with how you attract clients, because you're really just making shit up at the beginning. 
<laughs> you know, I think most people would admit that. I think that's one of the secrets that most people don't tell you about life. And you know, when you're a kid, you look up at the adults and you're like, oh, the adults have it figured out. And then you, you, you know, you graduate college or you get out onto your own and you're like, oh yeah, maybe one day I'll figure it out. You know, they, they must have it figured out. My boss has it figured out. And then you get into the business world and you figure out the boss doesn't know shit. You figure out the adults don't know shit. You figure out the politicians don't know shit. You figure <laughs> out like nobody, just all the way up, nobody tells you that the secret is they're all just making it up. Uh, and so I think that is, again, going back to why you should experiment and why it's so difficult at the beginning of this phase to gain traction. Um, Joe, do you, have, do you wanna go in, into any more specifics there? I, I'm trying to think of like, I would do anything. Same with you. Like I would just take any project, you know, a couple hundred bucks, 500 bucks, a, a thousand bucks, whatever it was. If you wanted to pay me, I was going to like do something creative for you. If I could get somebody to pay me for something I was in and I would see people at the time who were like, no, I'm only going to charge X for my projects or I'm not going to, you know, but they didn't have any traction, you know, and it's hard to like set those thresholds when you don't have traction where I was just like, give me whatever, you know, just give me whatever until we get to a certain point. And then once I got to a certain point where I just had too much to do, then I was like, okay, let me, you know, let me increase a little price. Let me add a little bit more. Let me try something different. And sometimes I find myself in the middle of projects because I was a little less judicious than you, Joe. I'd just be like, fuck it, I'm in. Like, I'll take it, whatever. <laughs> you got some money, I'm whatever, <laughs> you know? And so I think some, that some of that has led to really amazing skill development. And some of that has led to hair loss and gray beards at 38. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. And I said before that I, you know, I turned down projects that I didn't think I could take. Mm. And that's really, that, that was the first thoughts of bringing people into the team. So now I got a little bit of knowledge and I thought, well, instead of turning down this design project that I know that I'm not a good enough designer to handle, let me go and try to bring in a designer. Let me see if some other mm. person is able to do this skill. JavaScript. I can't do this, but you know what? I think somebody else can. So now let me open up the yes to more projects. Yeah. So that, you know, that the troubles early on can help you scale the team. Uh, we're, we're not necessarily talking about scaling the team today, but that's one option for growth. Uh, right. I, I want to focus a lot on that individual growth, but yeah, when you can't do something as an individual, that's the sign to start growing the team. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the, um, you know, that's the interesting path a lot of folks have to take. And I think most people should focus on, you know, like just, just again, find a channel for some revenue exchange, right? Find someone to pay you for something, find an open door for you to start doing a little something for dollars and then experiment and explore some of that. So, um, yeah, Daniel Brasnio here is saying, uh, we tend to forget how hard it is to start a new business and work for nothing while gaining a client base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's something that's easier to do the younger you are, the less responsibilities you have, the less obligations you have. If you've got a family, if you've got obligations, if you've got a mortgage and car payments and things and blah, blah, credit card debt, this, that, the other, it becomes really, 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 really hard to do this stuff. Um, you know, one of the things, it, it just takes a lot of time, you know, and so you have to decide where you want to prioritize your time, what specifically you're trying to do. Um, and how you want to grow. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Grace Walker in the house. Hello. Brandon Tancott in the house. Hello. Melissa Mendez. Love the convo. Glad you're here. Hello. Uh, let's see. Lost money for a couple of years. We do more than Webflow stuff, but still it takes a while to make money. Yeah. What do they say? Like if you, if you make it past your third year, it's like, okay, now, you know, you know, you probably got something that first year or two, it's so much up and down. It's so much up and down that like, it'll drive anyone insane. I remember some of those nights, you know, because you give up your social life too, to learn something as technically complex as Webflow at the level it takes to really like, just take it to the next level. It becomes difficult. You know, it means a lot of commitment from your time. It means like being buried in that screen and, um, I think this is the same with a lot of really skilled traits where you have to just kind of give yourself to it. It takes getting lost into this new skill to really kind of level up. You know, you can do incremental if you want. You can learn an hour a week, okay. It might take you two years to really get good at that. Or you can get lost and go crazy for like two or three months and just just obsess, you know? And then bang, you take, you take a sprint. But it depends, right? If you, again, if you have family, if you have obligations, if you have other things, maybe you can't do that. So, I don't know. 
Any thoughts there, Joe? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> from, from Cooper, someone paying me anything to practice is a dream. Yeah, that is a great point. If, if And Melissa follows up, you can definitely get a job and use it to practice your skills. Yeah. This is a great way to get started. You can avoid that first year making below minimum wage if you get that knowledge and get paid for it. And then you go off on your own and you have that knowledge and you maybe you, you need some time to find clients, but you don't have to use time to find your skills. Yeah. So yeah, Grace confirms here. Yeah. John Saunders in the house. What's up? Lucas is saying, whenever you're broke, just give a few months and know that things can turn completely to a way better situation within only six months. And that time goes by fast. Yeah, it goes by fast unless you're hungry, man. Time is real slow when you're hungry. So I agree with that. And, and, and then a hunger is what drives you. You know, the hunger is what pushes you to go out there and really get it done. I think a lot of times if you're a little comfortable, if you've got the things you need, if, you know, maybe you do have that job and you're just trying to break out to the side, it's a little easier. Sometimes, like for me, I had to be fully committed. First of all, the world kind of chewed me up and spit me out. So I had circumstances that kind of said, hey, this is what you're doing now. Um, and maybe if it was my choice, I wouldn't have done it the same way. But I think there is that moment where you just have to decide, am I going all in on this? Am I betting big on myself? And we've talked about some of this stuff, or am I gonna try to dabble in this on the side and eventually see what it turns into? We have some really nice comments. Yeah, which one the, are you looking at? The crowd here. Uh, we have a, a bit of a chain. John says, agree with Melissa, you literally get paid to perfect your craft. And Philip follows up, that's what I'm doing now. I'm rebuilding my job's website, currently in WordPress, in Webflow. I plan to use the knowledge to put myself out there more. Nice. And Philip, I see you here all the time. So, you know, you keep coming up to, to events, you keep putting yourself out in the crowd and you have that knowledge, that's the next step. And Melissa says, I think that's the first thing I say to somebody who asks, should I quit my job to take on freelance full time? If you're just starting, get a job, practice for a couple years, then quit. That is an interesting model. Yeah. That is a great, great way to get started. Now, oh, and John, nice. Working for someone also gives you the opportunity to learn from an agency. Structure, SOPs, leadership. You can learn how you want to structure your own company when you branch off. Nice, yeah. interesting. And I'm curious, have, has John, have you done this? And Melissa, have you done this? Uh, because these are these are great comments. I'm I'm curious if this is something that you have experience with, or or now you have the experience being a leader in the space. Grace says it took me three years working for someone else to feel like I was somewhat ready to go out on my own. Nice. I think we're seeing a trend here, Rymar. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> that's that. It's an it can be an important thing. Some people just want to go out and do it. Right. Again, my life chewed me up, spit me out. I found myself in a position where I kind of had to reinvent myself. Um, and I didn't have the luxury of going to find a job or go get this because nobody was hiring in that space. Uh, when you're talking about 10 years ago, you know, 12 years ago when I was doing this, it wasn't as prolific as, as, as it is now. The tools weren't as uh, robust as they are now. And, you know, again, I was just in a position where I had to get scrappy and figure it out. I also didn't have a lot of bills or obligations or things at the time. Um, and the ones that I did, I just kind of said, fuck it. And <laughs> you know, whatever happens. And so I was able to, to do that, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not the path I would recommend for most, you know? Um, and Joe, I think is kind of the same way where again, he said 13 grand he made you know, a thousand bucks a month. What, you know, living in New York, that's not a recommended path for you folks. Like this is not a thing you should want to go out and do. Uh, this is not like, yeah, what, what Melissa and John and Grace are saying here are a much better way to kind of get your bearings figure out and learn. Um, but, but not everybody gets that opportunity. So, uh, John's got an answer to your question here, uh, Joe. Okay. John says I worked at an agency for four years and consulted with agencies on UI UX before starting my biz. I was terrified, man. Yeah. That, yeah. uh, absolutely. Yeah. I think, okay. Melissa. Yes. I actually worked at Datagram for three years, then started freelancing on the weekends then quit after three years. Yeah. Okay, nice. I didn't know that about either person. Yeah. Very nice. cool. I'd love to bring up 
two comments from Shane Grady. Yep. Shane is now giving a devil's advocate answer here. He first says, is there a price in which it's not acceptable to practice versus not? Mm. And then a follow-up comment, I have some ethical concerns with using clients as a learning ground. At what point are you misrepresenting your experience? Well, you should never be misrepresenting your experience. If you have no experience, zero experience, you should make that clear on the call. It's very rare that someone's going to work with you without seeing any past sites. So first, there's no reason to misrepresent. Hey, I'm brand new at this. I'm going to give you a great price because I'm still learning. But I can promise you this. I can promise you this. And I can promise you this. Mm -hmm. And as long as you hit those promises, the price doesn't matter. Your experience level doesn't matter. You just you make promises and you keep those promises. Just be transparent. So, Shane, I wouldn't even get into this thought process. I would just go the transparency route. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what we were mostly talking about, too, is doing this as an agency where you're not necessarily learning on the client's dime. Specifically, you're learning under the tutelage, hopefully, of an agency. That's literally what you're going to do. That's like an entry-level position. That's like the ideal ground is to go in and saying, hey, I'm kind of green. I'm here to help you grow agency. And then you don't start out by saying, hey, I'm here to learn from you for a year and then I'm gonna leave you, right? That's not the way to get the job. Uh, the way to get the job is to you know, let them know you're there to bring value. And then if you see the opportunity, hey, nothing's stopping you from leaving two years, a year, six months, whatever, down the road. Um, but yeah, I, I agree, Shane. And I think my strategy as, as I was learning was always do it for myself and then maybe charge people for it. So I used my playground, my website, my experience as that proving ground to test all the things. And this is why I became a blogger, mostly because I had a lot of time and so I just started sharing my story. Um, and that led to just learning about the web. The more I tinkered with the web, the more I learned about building websites, the more I learned about building websites, the more I found people wanted me to pay me to help them build their websites. And so I agree, I think the best way to learn is really to vet it on yourself and then take that stuff out to clients, so. Um, yeah, Daniel, this is a good point too, Joe, as a follow-up to some of that. Daniel says, the best clients trust you so much that they are willing to financially support you in learning new stuff just because they want to work with you. Finally found one. Nice. Totally, totally, totally agree. My first ever paid project, I got on the phone and said, I've never made a project before, ever. I have these sample sites that I've built for a like I made, a, I made a website for a party I was having, like just random things. These work, but I, I have no experience with clients. I wanna charge you $500, and if you don't like it, you don't have to pay me. But if you like it, we'll go live with it, and you pay me the $500. Mm. And she loved it. She was like, this is, this is amazing. Of course I wanna do this. So yeah, she, does, she, she said yes, and I still do a yearly update for her. Six years later, she's still, I, I service her site personally for a few hours each year. And yeah, that was total transparency. Yeah. So Shane, back to your comment that I was just super upfront. I don't know anything. You're going to have minimal risk, but I can do this. Yeah, and to take it back to the core of the show, I think Joe has always done a good job. And it's one of the things I've always admired about Joe is about that customer satisfaction. You know, to hear that at this point, he's still personally supporting his, you know, one of his first web clients uh, just says a lot about what it takes to really build that long term growth because that stacks, right? You keep doing that for people over time. Now he's not managing lots of people's client sites anymore, you know, but um, it just, it's a testament to that, what it takes to kind of do that. So a lot of times I think Grace says it here, good things take time. You know, a lot of times we see these things, we see people break out, we see a Melissa Mendez break out into the scene and, you know, they get featured and, and even John Saunders or even Grace, right? So we got three kind of Webflow celebs here in the chats who they've all been featured by Webflow. They're all kind of breaking out into the scene. They seemingly came from nowhere, but as we're seeing here, they worked for agencies for years. You know, uh, Melissa saying it sucks to be broke. Well, how do you know that? Well, she's probably been broke, right? So having a job while you learn <laughs> keeps the stress away from relying on freelance money. And so, you know, we have these journeys and we have these paths and a lot of times we see these things and we see when somebody breaks out and we get real excited or we get, okay, so the design joy thing, for instance, right? Like, let's, let's take a look at this. This is a good time to, to bring this in because I published my first tweet two months ago and then look at the time frame of what this happens, right? In that same time span, 
and design joy has grown from a run rate of 1 million per year to 2 million, almost exclusively due to Twitter. So this is the virality of the potential here. You know, this is how things can explode. But here we go, literally, uh, just yesterday, have made a very difficult decision to let go much of my base at DesignJoy. Uh, and, and if we've been following this story, you can see, you know, like, there can be viral growth, and then there can be repercussions of that. And it looks like, oh, there's Joe again. Joe, have you heard any, any of the, um, are you back with us? Hello? I'm back. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. You, you brought up the design. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was just transitioning into that because it's like, um, you know, the success of, of this thing, it's, you know, we all want to grow. We all want to grow fast. We all want to like get up to speed, but, um, it doesn't always go like that. You know, it doesn't always work out the way we want things to, to, to grow. And so I don't know, let's, let's make, let's, let's switch to the next topic a little bit here. Let's, we've talked a bunch about um, the story here. Let's talk a little bit about generating this viral growth. Um, you know, managing specific growth. We're going to talk a little bit about how, you know, how many clients is too many, finding balance between this quest for money. It seems like everyone right now is in this state where they're building in public and everyone wants to talk about my monthly recurring revenue or my ARR, or I just closed this $50,000 deal or whatever. And it seems like a lot of folks are focusing on, you know, this hustle of going and getting the dollars uh, to grow. And that becomes glamorous, right? That's like the, you know, I don't know, the Instagram influencer who, you know, I, I don't know, gets, goes hot for, gets, gets uh, famous for, for whatever reason. And we all just look and we're like, what does this person have? Right. So we all kind of compare ourselves to others, but, uh, the definition of virality is kind of unpredictability, right? If we all knew how to go viral, if, if we could tell you, Hey, there's a recipe for driving viral sales, like we would all be doing it. So there's a little bit of kind of unpredictability here. I think a lot of it goes into kind of being consistent and creating your own opportunities for luck. Um, but, but Joe, what do, you, what do you think when it comes to consistent growth, when it comes to scaling? Because FinSuite's growing fast. Webflow's growing really fast. We're seeing hyper growth in, in, in a lot of places. You know? So how do you balance that? How do you generate some of that growth? How do you balance some of this? Um, you know, let's start with just generating some of the, the viral growth and, and gaining traction at the, at the beginning stages here. Well, I like to think of viral growth a little bit differently in the web industry than in, let's say, the Instagram world. We can, if you're on Instagram, your viral growth may be millions of subscribers, right? Nobody is, nobody is considered viral when they increase 100 subscribers. But if you're in the web world and you you go from five clients to 100 clients, that's now considered viral growth. Mm. So yeah, we, we normally talk about this viral concept on YouTube and social platforms, but I like to think of viral as a lot more contained. And I almost think of FinSuite as going through some viral growth within the last few years. For example, doubling the client base. That I see as viral growth. It's not it's not millions of anything. We don't have we don't have hundreds of thousands of YouTube views, uh, but yes, we do. <laughs> compiled, <laughs> compiled, <laughs> compiled. I want I want one video with a hundred thousand. Then right, we're all viral. Right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I think the viral growth really comes from the hard work. Mm. It's there's no way to fake the viral growth, sustained viral growth in this industry. You know, maybe you can get some spurts of viral growth, but sustained growth and having that be viral, it just comes from hard work. And like I said before, it came from the hard work of telling that person they didn't have to pay me if I didn't get the job done. And I worked really hard to get the job done, R working really hard to make sure that everybody coming onto the team is doing a really, really high quality job spending a lot of time on content and tools and all of this stuff, all of that is what's leading to the viral growth for FinSuite. So it, I think of it a little bit differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a good way to think about it is honestly in context because virality doesn't necessarily have to be that million views, you know, um, things can spread virally inside of, and the Webflow community is, you know, it's big, but it's not that big. You know, so it's hard to see in in a few years. This is a different story. 
right? In a few years, I think we'll see lots of, you know, there'll be so much activity in this community. But right now, you know, you don't see lots of videos with 50,000, 100,000 views, a million views. You know, you just don't see that in this space. And it's just to do with the size of the community. So I think viral growth inside of this uh, growing ecosystem looks a little different, Joe, to, to your point there. So I think that's like a fair point. And especially in a world where you can go viral for your dog eating treats on its upside down. Like you can go viral for literally anything on these social platforms. It doesn't necessarily translate to hard work. Yeah. But in this industry, in what we are doing right here, that's that's how it happens. Yeah. So yeah, and, and you can go, we, we can bring back the design joy concept. He had massive, he has massive viral growth. I think he just started Twitter a few months ago and he's got 19,000 followers or 18,000 followers. That's a lot in a very short period of time. And yeah, there was a negative tweet about him the other day, but I am sure he has worked really hard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. All those clients, all that, that effort, that's really hard work. Uh, and we see that he's now learned, he's, he's getting this new perspective on everything. Uh, but it it doesn't discount any of the hard work that went into to getting to that point. Yeah, and let's take a look at this actually, because most people probably don't know this, but this was the second time around. He first started with the product called Hue, unlimited design for startups to enterprise. It was the number four product of the day in 2017. So this is not the first rodeo, right? This this guy Brett has been trying to do this thing for a while here, and. I think it's interesting because he's been so much up and then down here. Let's see, refunds will finish the current months for devs and leaving them without, okay. So yeah, there's like a string. I, I would encourage you to just go through um, because he talks a little bit about the mental health up and down. I thought it was interesting as he was going viral, then started selling these $500 one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that I thought was you know a sign of like getting too close to the top where you're not only are you overwhelmed with the design work, but now you're telling other designers how to kind of do some of that. But it's interesting to read through the story here and just see, um, you know, how, how this, how this does go, how this does become viral, how things take time. But again, like, let's look at this graph here, you know, right. So look at it, you know, and, and, and again, you never know when something's going to go viral on the internet, right? The best thing you can do and this is why Webflow is important because I remember the first time I went viral on the internet. One of the first times one of my blog artists w w went viral. I found myself on the top of medium.com and I was like in the top five articles on medium.com. Next thing you know, I'm looking at my Google Analytics. I'm seeing like 80,000 views a day on my website. I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know, and <laughs> I was not ready for that kind of traffic. My server was not beefy enough. The site kept crashing. There was no real calls to action. There was no e-commerce store. There was no subscription. There was no membership. There was no thing there to, to take advantage of all of this traffic. This is actually one of the things that led me into the space where I was like, hey, look, I'm driving attention. Why am I not rich? Right. I'm on the front page of the Huffington Post. I'm on the front page of Elite Daily. I'm on the front page of Medium.com, Business Insider, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. And yet my bank account's still empty. And I started thinking like, well, how is this game like that? So I see the appeal of wanting to see that kind of structure and then saying and spending, you know, some time figuring out, well, how do I build something so that if something like that happens again, I can take advantage of those eyeballs. And that's kind of what happens here. And that's the potential of what we're seeing on Twitter and social as it becomes to building digital products. This is really what we all aspire to at a certain level is to put something out online and have the whole world say, oh my God, can I please pay you for your product? You know, this is like our dream is to just have money gushing in to the point of millions of dollars a year, right? But you cannot like create that. The best thing you can do is show up consistently every day, put out your best foot forward and cr consistently create opportunities for collisions between you and this crazy world called the internet that we're building. The cool thing about the business that we're in is that we are direct manipulators of this interface that everyone is touching to do these things. Right. So the ability to create your own website, to be able to the ability to create your own landing page or your own space so that if something does go viral, you can take that and run with it and then maximize that. Put some bucks in your pockets, build a business out of it, build a career, change your family's life, change your whatever. Like that's the fun of what I think we're doing and what appeals to all of us. But that's also the balance that comes with trying to figure out how to do this. You know, that's the that's the hard part, I think. And you can live a very happy and fulfilled life without viral growth. Mm. Some people want it. Some people have that craving that you're talking about of just everybody wants to buy their. Th 
you put a tweet out and it gets 150,000 comments, right? Everybody, that's, that sounds great. But you can live a very, very successful career inside this industry with a flat line, no growth, right? You can get up to a certain amount and say, I am super happy with this workload. I'm super happy with the revenue coming in. I don't need any more people on my team or I'm just fine as solo and that's okay. And that's, that's a great part about business. You can choose to grow, you can choose to stay. And Jeff says it perfectly, viral growth may not be sustainable, but growing slow and consistent is okay too. And it absolutely is. People have different desires. People have different everything. So you need to find that about yourself. You know, if you want to go, if you want that viral type growth, you know, maybe you have a different strategy than somebody that is very content with the, the static mm. growth. Yeah. 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 And I'd much rather, I think, have a consistent, you know, scalable, stackable, reliable growth and then see occasional little, you know, little pops. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> what happens is then you have an, a strong base and the stronger that base is, the better you can handle those viral explosions, right? If you're just one person, a la Rymar circa 2014 and your blogs, you know, going viral on Huffington Post, well, you're just one dude trying to figure out the internet. Like, I don't know shit, right? If I had the skills I had now, right? If I had the website I had now, I promise you that attention would have turned into crazy dollars, okay? Um, but it's, it's a different thing, right? So this is all about preparation. You know, they talk about luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I think that's all you can do is to set yourself up here is create the, the most solid foundation you can so that you can take opportunities of, you know, this beautiful new tool that we all have at our disposal here. Totally. That, that is such a great point. I'm glad that we're bringing up these both sides here. And I'll bring up a comment from Felix. I just want that flat line trying to get my revenue to be the same as my salary as when I was a product designer in my previous company and I'd have achieved my goal. Perfect. This is, it's so nice to have this goal in front of you, understand it, and then work towards that goal. You know, when, when you're trying for the viral growth, it's hard to really get to goals because things don't grow predictably. That's the part of viral. It's not predictable. So you can say, oh, I want this thing in the future and expect that you get there because it's not going to be like that. It could be higher. It could be lower. But when you have that, I want this exactly. And this is right there attainable. This is what I see. That is, yeah, that's, uh, it's great. Uh, I'm really happy you shared that, Felix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and John had a, a, another good follow-up here, Joe, if you want to take that one too. John, so true, Joe. Our agency has grown slowly over the last eight years with a small team and enjoying each product build. Also, great work compounds. Absolutely, it does. That's where the hard work comes. Just because you're not going viral doesn't mean you're not working hard. John, I know you work hard and I know your team works hard. And that's why you continue the slow and awesome growth over eight years. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and Nicola brings a good point here. Yes, when you see 20 plus uh, persons, I think he's saying persons that wanna pay 4K a month, it's not easy to say no. This is true. This is yeah. a, uh, what in the insurance world they call a, um, a moral, uh, oh, what is it? Um, I can't think of the word, a, a moral risk, right? It's like, how it's hard to say no. You know, if you've got something out there, who's going to stop? Who's going to say, no, nah, I'm not going to take, you know, like I'm going to, I'll probably do it too. If I have a business that's going viral and I'm going to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I scale this? But it's hard to scale. Right? It's hard to scale the quality of design, the, the nuance approach, the relationships you have to manage, the, you know, the knowledge you have to bring to the table in a hurry. Cause I, like we said, this thing grew in two months. So most of these clients probably came in in a hurry, dumped the money, paid the, paid the retainer and were expecting something that, that, they never got. And I think that has led to, you know, retracting some of that. So yeah, Nicola, that's a, that's a tough spot to be in because I agree with you. Um, but what you want to do is you want to keep, okay. So here, here's something to think about. If 20 people come to you and they want to spend four grand a month. Okay. That's cool. But how many of those will you keep for the second month is the question you want to ask. I'd rather have 10 people pay me 4k a month and keep those clients for two years or three years or five years, then take 20 clients on for 4K a month and keep them all for one month and then end up with only one or two clients the next month, right? 
because I wasn't able to fulfill. So I hear what you're saying, but this is where the long-term play comes in. And I think this is what you have to look at a little bit. And this is what comes from stacking and compounding and the things we've talked about is that you have to take a long-term vision here. And sometimes that's hard, especially if you're broke, especially if you need money, especially if you need something. And so um, finding that balance, finding a way to, you know, to grow and, and, and I don't know, take advantage of the opportunities, but also balance this. That, that, I think that's the real challenge, you know. And Penny brings up, I want a well-rounded life. Work plus gardening, spending time with friends and family, learning non-web stuff, and part-time university. Mm. So that goes right in line with what you just said, that you can have other priorities. You can do other things, that your whole world doesn't have to rely, revolve around the web. And you shouldn't be spending all of your time during the day in the web. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, there's a whole world out there. This is a great analogy, Adrian, here <clears throat> saying rather be a redwood tree than a kudzu vine. Uh, agree. You plant a redwood tree and it's going to take a long time for that bad boy to become, you know, like if you've ever been out to California and driven or been in those forests or seen like there's even trees you could drive in and through, you know, it's like that big. Um, here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years but yeah like when you come that solid it's hard to take you down right that's the thing that's how you become an institution everything else is just a passing fleeting thing right and that's the balance i think between freelancer or not and maybe that's where we can go to, to scaling or not you know if, if, if we uh, i don't think we're really following our outline much here yeah, we have at, great comments and any level I mean, of the these comp comments are just gold yeah 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 um are you seeing anything specific? Let's see, Melissa, there's a thin line between success and burnout. I agree. I think that's a, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Fimalon's got a little point here. Never understood what was the point of all the money talk. Feels like there wasn't anything else doing going for DJ besides the ARR. I think this is the trap of the social world because we're all looking for that social validation you know, a lot of us are spending a lot of time in front of these screens. And so it's different, you know, than before where maybe you'd be validated by your peers. And so you're looking for this validation online and then it becomes exponential and you're like, holy shit. And so you just, you know, just, you want to do more and more and more. And yeah, I don't know, sharing your revenue, sharing these goals has become a trend to build in public and share these numbers in public. But I don't know what that does to the overall conversation or what the impact of, you know, those type of discussion has long term on these things. Comment from Lucas relating to this, something mm -hmm. people in this freelance business niche don't talk about much is LTV, lifetime value. People worry about MRR and ARR, but not about LTV. And that's mm -hmm. all about quality assurance. So what's the value of your business and the clients of your business lifetime, not by month, not by year. And yeah, Lucas, that's absolutely true. And it's because the MRR and the ARR numbers, they do sell, they're interesting. They're cool to look at because you can't, you can't really imagine somebody's lifetime value as much. Yeah. You've been in business for two years. What, what does that mean? How am I supposed to tweet about that? But if I have numbers, hey, made this much this year, made this much this year, here's a screenshot. Now I have something to visualize and I have something to aspire to. I'm not saying it's the right thing to aspire to, but that's how a lot of people operate. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, it's a great comment. Yeah, and I, I wanna, Roland says here, they hope money attracts more money. It's not that they hope, like money does attract more money. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, like it, it, it just does, it works like that. Um, we don't have the time to go into the psychology of why or how, but it's important, you know, money is for whether you like it or not, whatever your thoughts are on money, capitalism, consumerism, et cetera. Money is a tool for measurement, right? Money is a mechanism of exchange, right? Money is the scorekeeper we use in our modern society to figure out how I trade my time, goods, services for your times, goods, or services, right? Before money, it was like a barter system and, you know, gets complicated to trade value because now I have to find direct people to exchange with, right? So if I have sheep and you have apples, but you don't need sheep, well, we can't really do trade. So money becomes a cool tool because I can say, hey, I'll sell my sheep to somebody who needs sheep. I'll take my money and I can buy your apples. 
And so this tool is very important from a societal standpoint for giving signals as to what has value and what does not have value. This is why expensive things are perceived to be better than cheaper things. This is why we talk a lot of times about selling a website for 500 versus selling for 5,000 oftentimes create a perception change in the value you're delivering. And so money does make a big difference here. And the perception of success comes with making money. This is how our society is currently built. And so to glorify this means to glorify your success and to bring more attention inside of that. And that becomes important if you're looking to scale virally. And so these are trappings that we can all fall into. And I think this is stuff that we all just need to learn and grow from. I think this is stuff that we can take the opportunity to not make some of these mistakes and build in public without maybe having to take some of the, the you know, the falling in public. So, you know, I have myself thinking maybe we should start releasing financials of FinSuite and get get some more <laughs> uh, some more traction. I, I'll bring up a comment from Daniel. I guess revenue becomes the measure of success. It could. I like to think that FinSuite is the opposite of this. Have enough money to oh, I'm out and am I back yeah you're back okay so money becoming the measure of success I like to think FinSuite is not it just doesn't follow that path we don't release any money numbers I don't like to think of FinSuite in terms of money I like to think of it as we need enough money to continue doing what we're doing and to continue operating and to continue growing that's it. Uh, I, I don't really have a clear picture of the money until the end of the year when we're doing taxes. And that's when the money becomes clear of how we did the, the entire last year. So yeah, I, I think it attracts people, but it's just, it, it's not everything. And, and that's one of the reasons I turned down the offer to buy FinSuite because I thought it was all based in money. It was like 100% money focused. They didn't care about anything else, none of the initiatives, none of the, the community stuff. We were doing hacks. We were just about to launch CMS library. None of this stuff mattered. And I didn't feel like that was a true representation of the company because we don't make a lot of money. And even now for the size of FinSuite and for as many people as we have here, I don't think we make a lot of money. We make enough money to continue doing what we're doing. And I think the lifetime value of the company is way, way, way more valuable than what you see on the balance sheet. So yeah, money brings in more money and money is a, a great way to, to market yourself, but it's not the only way. There are other ways. Yeah. Doing hard work, providing value, and just getting people interested in what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think re revenue becomes the measure of success, but it does become a measure of success. Yes. Um, and that's just a function of the current society. You know, look at what we glorify every day, right? The stock market performance, everybody's on crypto, right? The best cryptos are the ones that are worth the most money. The best businesses are the ones that can charge them more for their work. Look at Apple, look at the Nikes of the world. You know, like this is the game we're playing in, again, whether you like it or not. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, a lot of this stuff is just things you have to learn how to navigate as you go through. Uh, John Livingston saying, while I might be completely off, the Design Joy saga seems like it has a lot of red flags. I have a hard time believing any of it. Yeah, the, um, you know, if things sound too good to be true, they often are. A lot of times they, yeah, it just is. That's like a good thing to just remember in life. Pablo, value should be the measure of success. Unfortunately, value is hard to measure, whereas money is very easy to measure, which is why typically mm -hmm. money is exchanged for value and we use money as a surrogate for that exchange. So money is a measurement for an exchange of value. That's it, right? If you get into economics, that's literally one of the definitions of money, right? It's gotta be portable, it's gotta be easily divisible, it's gotta be a store of value, um, but also, you know, it has to be a measurement of value in order to be able to like actually have consistent exchange. This is what the free market is. Um, so unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that there's any other way to do it. There, there's other ways to do it, but I don't know that there's better ways to do it. Um, maybe we'll discover some of those over the next few years, right? As we build some of these tools and as people figure out more collaborative ways to build businesses that are not necessarily just driven by how much profit can you maximize out of this endeavor. How do you put a value on this show? Mm. 
How do you put a value on every week us coming, talking about this stuff, having anywhere between 60 and 120 people every week? There's no money that comes from this. You cannot put a dollar figure on it. We don't make any money from YouTube ads or anything like that. So in the eyes of a revenue focused examination, this would be zero. This would have zero value. So yeah, it's very hard to measure that. And you could even say impossible to properly measure it. Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, we would all do well to have a better mechanism for measuring the value and how we exchange it as individuals. I think that would be like a, a goal to aspire to. Uh, John Livingston, while making a living should be a goal, success should be geared around what we do for our clients. I agree. I think that's a good point. Um, mm -hmm. Josh Lowe, what's up? <laughs> Just came in late. It's all good. Money talk. Let's go. That's right. <laughs> Um, or really anti-money talk. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like the opposite of money talks. Tanette saying, I wouldn't release your numbers, okay? Yeah, definitely not. Rahul. That was a joke, by the way. Yeah. That's not, there, there is no way we're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Naked tech, shiny thing syndrome is like a financial STD. That's funny. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, Adrian Lexington saying, sometimes I look at a team size. Look at team size. A team of 45 must be somewhat successful to keep the doors open. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, there's so many comments here. I think actionable value for the community trumps financials every time. There's so much IP that's not mentioned. Yeah. And growing. Mm -hmm. I think this mm -hmm. is one of those things that a lot of people are starting to figure out. And we talk about this so much and some of y'all are figuring this out so well and others are trying to figure, see how you can do it. And others are just, you know, maybe missing the boat. But I think this is one of those things that if you learn how to navigate these waters right now, build and operate in this community, the potential is unlimited for your career. Okay. Felix says, I like to know how much people charge for a specific project. It helps me with pricing mine. Don't really care how much people make monthly, yearly. Yeah, Felix, that's a great point. Something that I always regret as a young kid was not knowing how much things cost. Mm. My parents never shared anything with me. How much, how much things cost, the, how much money the family had. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people don't share this stuff, but having that type of context into costs, how much other people are charging it for, am I competitive, am, am, am I not competitive, this. You? <laughs> ah. All right, well, I'm sure it was a good thought, whatever it was. Maybe he'll be back. Maybe not. Uh, let's see. <laughs> there he is. Hello, hello, Joe. Can you hear us? I'm in the I zone here, and I just keep blacking out. Oh. Uh, Am I back? There. You, hello? Check one, two. Hello, hello. Yeah, you're back. So to what Felix says, this is why I'm a lot more open about, hey, projects between this cost and this cost. Mm. It's, not, it's not the net profit. It's not the total revenue for the company. I, I agree with this. Don't care how much you make monthly, yearly, but I do care about how much services cost. It helps me run the business better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Daniel, this is, a, this is an interesting point, saying, yeah, 30 plus designers paid to replicate the design joy business model. That's the sad part. I'm not sure it's a sad part. I think it's, um, and maybe I wanted to talk a little bit about this because I think a lot of people who hired the design joy guy had to see this and think like, hmm, you know, but they wanted to take advantage of some shit too. They wanted unlimited design for cheap, right? And so I don't know who to fault here a lot of times, right? Like the guys out here building a product, okay, gets exposed a little bit, whatever, whatever. But I also think these folks that thought they were gonna get the world for you know going at something like this is, is hard uh, to, to justify you know, as a business if you're looking at this and you know what real design costs and if you think you're gonna get that for, for this at one of these services, like, I don't know. Um, Again, you get caught up in the, in the trend. Um, but I could also see if you're a designer and you're trying to break in, you're like, hey, 500 bucks to learn from somebody who's building a 2 million plus ARR business annually. Like that seems like a good investment, you know, in my future. So it's no different, I think, than buying a course from somebody or whatever. But again, I do agree that the motives here uh, is what was wrong. You know, like this was just, let me try to capitalize more on, on the virality, so. I, I also don't really think this is sad. 
I would like to think that these people did learn a lot in that session, the the five hundred dollars session. Mm-hmm. I don't think the design joy model is bad. This is not a bad model. This totally works. The only problem was there were too many clients. There were too many p- jobs and too many too much work that Brett had to do. That was the problem. It's not the model of the business. If you're a good designer, I think that's a rock star model. You can have 10, 15 clients and really do well for yourself. But when you have 30 or 40 clients, that's now a little too much. That's overwhelming. That's when it breaks and it doesn't work. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't think it's bad. It just, it needs to be represented in a different way, which it kind of seems like Brett's now taking that direction. Yeah. You know, he sent the tweet, lowering client level, and hopefully this gets to a healthy level that other people can replicate. Well, and he's using all the modern language that everyone loves to talk about. He's productized his service and, you know, turning this thing into a, an automated blah, blah, whatever. And, <clears throat> you know, again, this is all the dream. This is what we talk about. This is what you hear everyone like aspire to in the space. Uh, but Melissa nails it here. She says, if you pay for a membership to a certain product, you think at some level you're getting some standardization. So, and he talked about this publicly. That's what I think it's funny, how many people are selling products and doing things on, online and actually telling everyone what they're doing, but their clients have no idea because the clients like never come onto Twitter or the clients never go onto social. And I always wonder like, how are these folks getting away with some of this stuff? Cause it's like literally they tell the clients how they're scamming them because they're teaching other people how to do it on the side. And some people do this publicly or privately. And I'm, again, I'm not saying this was a scam or yeah, I'm just saying this happens. And again, the people being scammed don't know. Literally, if they just turn their head like this, they'd be like, oh, what'd you say? <laughs> you said you just doubled your price because, you know, X? Well, I don't think I, um, you know, agree with that business model. Bye. <laughs> you know, and I take my business. So I think a, a lot of times the customer is as responsible as the, the consumer, you know, in, in these situations. Eric, with a nice comment. Well, I'm still looking to do the design joy business model, but for Webflow. I just want two clients on retainer at around 1K a month, and I'd be happy. Eric, perfect. This is very attainable. Uh, I think this is something that, yeah, I I think a really good model to work up to, and you can stop at that level forever. And that's that's a great thing. Uh, We we talked about this earlier. So good for you, Eric. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And a second prompt, if anybody has a similar story to Eric, if you have goals that you know where you want to hit, Please share those in the chat. Let's hear about them. Let's yeah. read what people are working for, what people are going towards. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I have semi retired from using financial services inside of Webflow and Stripe Atlas APIs. You can take a share from each purchase order automatically. Hmm. Okay. There you go. You know, lots of ways to, yeah, to make money on the internet right now. Mm-hmm. Ju- Julie Mantini from a sales biz background perspective, create biz model, niche down, develop one system, two process, then three product, building an ac- economic moat with differentiation, creative and otherwise. That's it. Julie just summarized uh, 63 episodes of effing growth. <laughs> like <when YouTube comment. laughs> Value is in the eye of the beer holder. Oh, beholder. I'm sorry. Beer holder. <laughs> I like that. Never heard that. <laughs> Old dating jokes. I probably read that in a bar one time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, actually, I found a similar business model. Limitations, one active task client. Seems to be more reasonable. Okay. <laughs> Beer. Mm-hmm. DJ didn't do it, but Design Pickle is totally killing it with a similar business approach. A lot of times it's about implementation. This is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You and And you can also scale the one person shop design joy model. So imagine this same type of model, unlimited design, the 5,000 per month, but there's five people work. Okay. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Am I back? You're back. Every time you add a new designer to your team, now you can take on an an additional five to 10 new projects. So yeah, it's, it's a lot about execution and how you implement this plan. 
So yeah, I, 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 I agree with this, Pablo. I also want to talk to, um, to, to this a little bit here because let's see, for 5K a month, each client gets 0.6 days a month in time. Feels very unbelievable. There, I think he broke it down one time for his hourly rate and it was like 625 bucks an hour, which if you've like talked to lawyers or if you get high up on like consultant mm -hmm. stuff, like that's not crazy rates. It might sound crazy to you, but these are not crazy rates for people who are doing really high level, high value work. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know that we are the ones that get to say how much somebody should be paying for your time. I think that's the antithesis of this business. The, the, the idea of this business is that you get to go and define what your time is worth in a way that makes sense to you and build something that maybe allows you to justify that in a market. You know, this is why we build websites. This is why we build stores. This is why we, you know, like tinker with the web. And so to tell somebody that, hey, you're charging too much for your time, I don't know is a fair statement. Um, but I do agree that again, if you're the person spending the money, it has to come down to you as to whether you feel you're getting a good value for that money. And that's where I think this, you know, level of exchange needs to be taking place, you know? So shame on one person for maybe overselling, but shame on somebody else for, you know, trying to take advantage of, hey, let me get something at high value that's trending and maybe get something that's too good to be true for cheap. We have a comment from Julie mm -hmm. in response to the, what are you building? What are you going for? Julie says, I am building a B2B super niche web and email template model for 200 businesses, but there are almost 5,000 plus in that circle who need those services desperately. So that sounds like a, a lot of growth potential there yeah. and followed up with just trying to build it and pre-design for them low cost and high ROI and for me equals scale. Great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question, Joe. We all agree that in some conditions this model can work, but would you implement it, Joe? For design, no. For design, definitely not. And that's because I am not a designer. And previously I felt that I have failed in the design services field. So I wouldn't do it for design. Would I do it for Webflow implementation? Absolutely yes. This is something that we've lightly talked about on the agency side of FinSuite, not something we're actively going to pursue, but it's possible, I think, absolutely. If you, if you have a quick and efficient way to do things, people are willing to pay for that quickness and they're willing to pay for someone to be on call. So yeah, I would do this model for development, which is what I'm comfortable with. Yeah. And if I was a rockstar designer, if we had a whole team of rockstar designers, I would probably feel comfortable doing it on the design side as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's all about the promises. Yeah. It's all about the promises. If you make the right promises in the beginning, you just have to hit the promises. It feels very easy to me. So just make sure that you can do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. I think that was episode number two of F and mm -hmm. growth was how to make and keep promises to grow your brand. Yeah. Um, but we don't like sending people to those early episodes. Right? We're, much, we're much more refined now. <laughs> Are we? Are we really? <laughs> hold on, hold on. I got to go back because I, this will be a good time to, 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 you know, to review some of this feedback. This is uh fin is invaluable. Okay. Uh, the show is invaluable. Okay. There we go. But we all have fun. These streams conversations. There we go. Okay. So now we're back to mm -hmm. feeling good about ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> after a quick review of our first couple streams. They're actually not as bad as I thought. I've been listening back on, um, cause the podcasts are being released one a day. So I've been listening back to some of them and uh, I actually find myself, um, enjoying the conversation. So yeah. It was a little cringy because, you know, listening to yourself recorded is always weird in the past. But obviously, once once I got over that and started listening to them, I'm like, oh, okay, these are good. No wonder people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> Some, just like any... <laughs> <laughs> I go, shit, you said that. That sounds kind of smart. Sometimes I'm like, damn, that sounds a little <laughs> stupid. Or sometimes I'll leave like a thought hanging because I'm like moving too fast or something. But mostly it's like, oh, okay, this is good. We, we have that, the FinSuite quotes Twitter. Mm -hmm. Somebody started a FinSuite quotes Twitter. Love it. But sometimes I read those quotes and I'm like, 
am I speaking English? What the heck is this? You know, th how did I say it exactly like this? That, that That's not what I wanted to say. That just comes with being live and it comes with experience, just like anything else. Yeah, here it is. Just like anything else, when you made your first website, it wasn't as good as your 10th website and your 10th website isn't as good as your 50th website. Uh, and that I think goes for the show. I think over time, the show just gets better and better because we're going to continue Im improving. Yeah. Yeah. Works for anything. Yep. Uh, all right. Let's see. I think we're, yeah, hit the like button, folks. What, mm -hmm. What's going on here? What the heck is going on? Okay. Uh, let's see. We have a comment from Anshul. Yep. Uh, in response to the, what are you doing? What are you going for? And Anshul says, it just, became, it just becomes a matter of greed versus need. I am working towards four clients totaling 10K monthly for this year. Currently at six clients totaling 5K monthly. Upskilling to get there. Nice. Totally works. You, you either learn new skills, provide more services, work faster for your current clients, or you find new clients if they're not willing to pay you to get to that level. But yeah, that's, the, that's a great natural way to get there. Get more skills and charge for those skills. Become an SEO pro, now you can charge for SEO. <laughs> What's so funny? I'm still laughing at that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most important takeaway of the show. <laughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beer holder. No, F, <laughs> F and sweet quotes tomorrow. It's going to post that and we'll be canceled on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Penny's saying, we're all still here. You must have done something right at the start. Yeah. Well, we appreciate mm -hmm. y'all showing up. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always exciting for us to do this. I think we look forward to these streams just as much as anybody else getting here and hanging out and chatting with you all. Uh, totally a lot of fun for us. So, um, and Rahuli is saying, as someone that's currently binging through them, they are great. So great to hear that. Nice. Uh, Jeff McAvoy, somebody started the F and Sweet quotes. You don't know who. We actually just found out who it was. Uh, we did. Oh. We, it's not. They're not. They're not us. It's not us doing those F and Sweet quotes. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just found out who it was and have reached out to say, hey, uh, if you're interested, let's figure out how we. Yeah, maybe we can do some. I think it's Maria, wasn't it? No, it's not Maria. Interestingly <laughs> enough, <laughs> it was somebody who was watching the shows early on, they sent us a really nice message and said they had watched the streams early on and had took some of our advice to heart about wanting to find a unique way to kind of maybe stand out or do something in the community to build a little uh, exposure for themselves. So um, yeah, yeah, it was just, um, it's kind of fun how these things loop back around and, and how things happen. So someone whack that on a t-shirt. I'm sure it's out there. <laughs> Uh, this is, you can take this one, Joe, here, and we'll, we'll close out with just the last couple, um, couple comments. Naked Company says, I feel like the privacy policies, refund policies, terms and conditions, and cookie agreements, et cetera, should be referenced as legal fees and charged in the same respect. I don't know. Okay. I'm thinking is, is, are, are you talking about charging, yeah. passing them like straight through to the client as legal fees? Um, the hard part there is that oftentimes you're reusing a lot of those things, mm -hmm. you know, and honestly, if you're writing those for the client, then you're making mistakes. You should not be writing those policies for your clients. I think it, it may be about, we, we need to get them made so that mm. they're legal fees for us. Yeah. Our, our lawyer is expensive, great person really smart i i feel like it's the end result is worth it but geez that's it's the it's just the next level of of fees yeah. you know that 500 plus per hour it's wild right especially when they're ringing you up every when they're rounding up to the 15 minutes reading on an a phone email call or email or reading yeah. an email you get charged for mm -hmm. but right. it's good work yeah uh, Christopher Coleman is saying, even as someone who really dislikes freelancing and sales, really appreciate the conversation and think there's value here for those of us not looking to build our own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully there's some value here just as people operating in this ecosystem. You know, a lot of times this is useful for you as a freelancer, but a lot of times the strategies are good just in operating in the community, operating the space. So yeah, we're glad you appreciate that. That's a good point, Jeff. 
legal fees would imply some sort of liability, correct? Yeah, the reason lawyers charge a lot of money, especially for high value stuff, is because if they get it wrong, it comes back on them, right? So that's yep. a really good point there, Jeff. Okay, uh, we're at nice. 115. I think we're at a good, we're got a good jump out point here. Let me scroll back through and see if we uh, missed anything important to the top, but I don't think so. I think we got through most of it. Oh, and right on cue, Joe said, I'm leaving. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, everybody, any, any final thoughts, Joe? That's it. This was a great episode. I uh, really, really appreciate the community involvement here. I felt like half the show or more was all based on your comments. So yeah. if we keep doing this, we're going to keep having great, great episodes. Yeah, I think there's been like the last couple weeks have been good. Both Tuesdays mm -hmm. and Thursdays have just been, I mean, we do a bunch of like stream prep and we didn't, last week we didn't even get to half of the outline. This week we were off the outline on our first title slide and we were just off to the, to the races with the comments. Um, I like this format, this dialogue back and forth, current events, things, whatever. Um, so we'll, we'll keep experimenting with that. So I, I appreciate you all hanging with us. Um, Tanette is saying, let's see, invaluable. Thank you. Amazing work. Good conversation. Great, 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 great show. Thank you. Love the chat. Great. You guys are in the zone recently. Yeah, I think we're finally finding a groove. It took us 63 yeah. episodes. It took us 60 <laughs> plus episodes to just get comfortable getting up here talking. Oh. But hey, that's going back to the beginning of the episode. That's the three years that you spend working for a different company and then you go off on your own. The 63 episodes were us working for a different company. Mm. Now we're ready. We're going to be running full speed moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get that experience first before you get really, really comfortable in your in your practice. Yeah. And, an and another year from now, when we're over 100 episodes or five years from now, when we're at, you know, three or 400 episodes. And I think we're actually doing ourselves a disservice, Joe. We need to have uh, uh, we need to have like a Florida recount on our episode counts, especially as we're <laughs> migrating into this content, <laughs> this topics like Thursdays, because it's like we're at 63 but we do two weeks, two streams a week, and the the Thursday yeah. streams never pump our stream count. So we may need to have a recalculation and come through, and then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> maybe we're at a hundred streams already. So anyway, just something to think about there, because the Thursday streams are not bumping that number, and um, maybe they should be. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Anshul, this is a great comment. Thanks. Don't feel alone in this journey due to this group. Yeah, great. yeah. Don't underestimate the 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 value of one to one connections, folks. Um, Kevin Watkins. Okay. Roll another one. That's great. Yep. Um, yes. The live comment interaction was awesome. Yeah. If you appreciated this, if you liked the video, if you got any value out of this, we would ask you to go, um, yeah, leave a like, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, tell a friend, share the video, uh, whatever, you know, whatever you'd like to do. Comron is saying open talks are much better. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you boys. 11,000 subscribers. Yeah. We crossed that last night. So, mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you all. Have a great week. We'll catch you on Thursday. Bye bye. Okay, we're back.